Yes. After a series of teachings like we had uh, with Geshe, uh, Yeshi Tavke, um, you know, there's some points that always stick out for you that you want to go over a lot. So, uh, you know, some of the things that uh, how the body um, is not the substantial cause of the mind. Uh, that one, that uh, has never affected me. It's never been an issue of doubt or concern for me. So that wasn't, uh, although it was one of the prominent themes of the teachings, it wasn't the thing that, that hit me the strongest. What uh, really made me think was uh, Geshe-la, um, several times in the introductory motivation, traced uh, how our samsara arises and the, uh, the dukkha coming from the karma and then the karma from the aff afflictions, the, and then the whole thing of habituation that he spoke about, you know, the habituation with certain afflictions. And what came before the afflictions was is the uh, distorted conceptions. We went over the four distorted conceptions when he talked about true dukkha. And uh, it's also translated as inappropriate intention, but it's how we interpret things and different conceptions and beliefs that we superimpose that, and those shape what afflictions we feel in a situation. Yeah, so you have the, the dukkha from the, karma, from the karma, from the afflictions, from the distorted conceptions, and then habituation with both the distorted conceptions and the, um, the afflictions, and how much that habituation really uh, determines and influences what we experience. You know, uh, so, you know, of course I've known this, I've heard this for a long time, but uh, sometimes things just hit you a little bit stronger. And so how important it is to watch out for the habituation. Yeah, and as soon as a habitual emotion comes up, you know, like we should... Uh, know what our strongest emotion is and be especially watchful for that one, but also the ones maybe that aren't quite as strong and be able to see when we're getting into them again and recognizing that's habituation, okay? And, you know, not only is the affliction and the uh, distorted conceptions that gave rise to it not only are they um, not realistic because we've superimposed, you know, different conceptions, different ways of existence, and so on, and those things. So to see, oh, this habituation or this affliction, whatever I'm seeing, whatever I'm feeling right now, first of all, it's not true. Okay? It's fake news in the real sense of fake news. And it's also harmful because if I am habituated with non-virtuous afflictions and unrealistic distorted conceptions, uh, then I am implanting these things <coughs> in my mind again and again and again, you know, to my own detriment, okay? So uh, what that means is when afflictions arise, uh, when I get into um, my story about what, how, what the other person did was wrong and I'm right and all that, to stop it, and it's like, this is garbage. Yeah, no sense spending my, my precious human life on that. And then even going further back, you know, the afflictions and the uh, distorted conceptions are rooted in ignorance, you know, specifically uh, the ignorance that grasps the I, 
you know, one's own self as inherently existent. And that one's much harder to, to see, yeah, because we are so enveloped. I mean, we live in the, like a fish in water. We live within our, our self-grasping ignorance, yeah. But it leads to start to notice it more and, and trace this pattern of, of the evolution of our samsara, you know starting with that, that thought, me, okay? So it's not just any thought, me. It's me, it's me, okay? It's me, the one who is the center of everything, the thing that I care about the most, yeah? And to start to ask, well, like, my mother asked me when I was a kid, just who do you think you are? You know, this I, that is the thing I care about the most, that gives forth this whole, that leads to my own dukkha. Uh, you know, what is this? What is that mental state? And what is it holding on to? Yeah. Because like I said, it's so habitual that you don't realize it's there and you don't even recognize what it is grasping at. You just take that as normal. Yeah, that's normal. That's, you know, how, how I think of myself, how I appear, just the thought of I, the big I, that's normal. That's, you know, that's the basis of my existence, isn't it? You know, the basis of my existence is I, that thought, I. How can, in, in the world, can I ever question that? Yeah, and that, that's why we're still in samsara, lifetime after lifetime after lifetime, because we never question that, okay? So just, uh, you know, watching the mind and, and stopping when we notice some of the, uh, you know, you can stop when you notice the physical actions, physical verbal actions you're doing, and going, oh, habit there. Trace it back to the affliction that's causing it. Oh, the habit I have with that affliction. Yeah, every time somebody does, doesn't say good morning to me, I get mad. Where does that affliction come from, that anger, from my distorted conception, which, uh, that, which says everybody, everybody uh, has to like me, and the way they like me is by saying good morning. And if they don't sound, if they don't say good morning, it means they don't like me. Okay. Now, when you say it out loud, it sounds totally ridiculous, doesn't it? You know, to not, that, that to take somebody not saying good morning, meaning that they don't like me, and that meaning that therefore I have to be mad at them because they don't like me. Yeah? And when you say it out loud, it sounds totally ridiculous that we think that way. Yeah? And emotionally respond in that way. And yet, there it is. Yeah? what we do. So I find it actually quite helpful just to, to, quote, quote, say it out loud to myself in my meditation. Because when I do that, it's like, huh? You know, it's like, this is ridiculous. The fact that I'm, you know, getting upset about X, Y, and Z. Okay, so that shows us the afflictions. It shows us the distorted conception. And then to take it the step to see how all that distorted conception, all that affliction is rooted in the, you know, the self-grasping ignorance that not only sees myself as inherently existent, as a solid, independent thing there. I mean, I set myself up just, just... you know, like the description says, inherent existence is the object is able to set itself up. Yeah, I set myself up. Nobody caused me. 
I'm not a, ca a cause-produced phenomena. I'm just here, yeah? And then not only grasping the self, grasping the aggregates, you know? Yeah, there's a body, there's feelings, there's discriminations, there's all my emotions, there's my consciousness. All these things are very real. And I have to protect them, yeah? Because they're very fragile especially my reputation, yeah? Or especially my self-esteem, what I think of myself, yeah? Because if those people don't say good morning, it's because they don't like me, which means something's wrong with me, yeah? So I'm not only mad at them for doing that, but I'm also sitting there going, what's wrong with me, yeah? Because other people liking me is, the, is how I rate my value as a human being. Yeah, not, not by my virtue, not by how I practice, not by uh, if I, uh, you know, try and do good things. No, how I rate myself is by what other people think of me. If they don't like me, it means I'm bad. Oh, that means I'm really, you know, awful. And then, then you sit and stew in all of this, yeah? I mean, somebody didn't say good morning. And I'm using a very stupid example, but it happens, doesn't it? Yeah? And you sit and you tell the story to yourself over and over again, yeah? We ruminate on it, yeah? making our case how the other person is wrong, how we're right. And it's all based on made up garbage. Ugh. Yeah, totally superimposed, made up garbage. Yeah, the essence of real fake news. <laughs> And, but notice how your mind gets involved in it and how once you're hooked by it, you know, that rumination goes on and on. And do you do that? You sit and ruminate? You tell the story of what happened. I walked into the room. They looked at me. They didn't say good morning. Oh, that means they don't like me. That means I did something wrong. What could I have done wrong? But no, I didn't do anything wrong. Why don't they like me? They're prejudiced against me. And then all these other people, they also act the same way. And I don't know, it's just somehow, I'm a good person, but nobody seems to recognize it. And then you tell the story to yourself again. And you get madder. And then you tell the story to yourself again and get really mad you know, at other people and also feeling terrible about yourself and that the world is totally unfair because this thing just hit me. Yeah. And you know what, you know what I realized? One of the things that God has conditioned his children to always blame outside when we're unhappy is when you're a kid and you trip and you get hurt, your parents say, make bad to the floor, it hurt you. Yeah, do you remember being told to make bad? Oh, well, some of you don't. But some of us, and I hear parents around, it'll happen, you know, you, you, um, uh, you, there's some broken glass and you, uh, you know, you nick yourself on it. Make bad to the the grass, the glass, because it hurt you. When you're a really little kid, yeah, you're crying, oh, my head hurts. Then, oh, make bad to that thing because it hurts. So then you get used to, it's the bad is always coming from outside. Yeah? So... 
Yeah, so just all these contradictory thoughts in our mind, okay? But how they're rooted in just this fundamental way in which we superimpose a way of existence onto ourselves and everything around us that they don't have, that nothing has. Okay, so, so practice is seeing this in our life and then you know, as much as we can, trying to actually identify what the super, superimposition is. It's much easier start with how we superimpose permanence on what is impermanent. Start with how we superimpose happiness on what is not pleasurable. Start with how we superimpose purity on what is not and what is, is impure. Start with those three. They're much easier to, to identify, you know. And then from there, going to how we impose a self or superimpose a self on everything. And by seeing this whole mechanism, already we're starting to question it and take it apart. So in this catching the habituation, when you have the awareness of how deeply embedded these things are, where does, if anything, where does self-acceptance and compassion come in? Because I find myself sometimes when I, when I get wind of what I'm doing, if I use compassion and self-acceptance, I caught it, yep, this is an old pattern, sometimes that's not strong. It's almost like a complacency settles in. Okay, you saw it. Yeah, you know it's deep, you know it's long term. Where does where does that kind of, you know, supporting yourself and at the same time cuz I fall into complacency. Then it fall, happens again and I calm myself cuz I'm attributing myself to the affliction and to the inappropriate attention. Yeah. I've got myself intermixed. Where is it appropriate to really, you know, use those two um device tools and where is it to be very clear where they don't serve. I'm yeah. a little bit puzzled on when. Okay, that. yeah, this is this is a very good question, because we have to know how to use this the uh, ex self acceptance and self compassion in a proper way so that it doesn't become complacency. So you use it if your mind has the habit of then trashing yourself and blaming yourself, that's when you uh, have the thing of, okay, I made a mistake, I accept it, I'm not going to blame myself and trash myself, okay? Yeah. Um, or, uh, yes, I fell into my rage again. Um, I can have some compassion because I'm so uncontrolled. So that helps settle the mind so that we don't dig ourselves deeper into that ditch. But then I don't think just that is sufficient because, as you said, it's very easy to just leave it at that without actually researching how an affliction is erroneous, how the... Um, the distorted conception is erroneous, how the grasping at eye is erroneous. So I think we have to also go and do that analysis going further back. The self-acceptance, self-compassion prevents digging the ditch too deep. But to really stop that whole thing altogether the self-acceptance and self-compassion won't do it. Yeah? Just in the same way that they say, uh, you know, Bodhi, we all work so hard to generate bodhicitta, but bodhicitta is not the thing that will liberate us from samsara. We need the wisdom realizing emptiness to do that. So the same thing here, the self-compassion, the self-acceptance, it's good, it helps, but we need to really generate the wisdom and, and see the whole mechanism of the erroneous, ignorant mind. Okay? 